You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bowes, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bowes Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. You can find all of your sales, equipment, and rental needs at McAllister.com. We are pleased to announce our podcast is now a member of the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You can find Leaders and Legends at allindianapodcastnetwork.com. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is Carmel Mayor Jim Brainerd. We are also joined by our frequent co-host and sponsor, Girl Scouts of Central Indiana CEO, Danielle Shockey, who has the added benefit of being a Carmel resident. And a fan of our, of our guest today. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Danielle. It's, it's thank good you. to have fans out there some days. Thank you, Mayor, for coming on the podcast. We really appreciate your time. It's great to be with you. It's, uh, it's a great thing you're doing here. And uh, listen to your sponsors. They're all good sponsors, too. Well, I appreciate that. The Girl Scouts have been particularly generous, as has uh, the McAllister Machinery Group. Uh, my first sponsor was, was personally was P.E. McAllister, who I know you know, who we lost just about a year ago today. I have to tell you a great P.E. story. Everybody's got one. I was in Germany with my family once, and we hired a tour guide to take us around the area of the Battle of the Bulge. And France was on the French-German border, and getting the guide's car, and he was a history teacher at the local university, but doing guide work in the summer. And first thing out of his mouth, oh, you're from Indiana. Do you know Pershing McAllister? <laughs> <laughs> and they apparently were friends. So I thought it's a small world. I think P.E. took a tour of either the World War II or the Napoleonic battlefields as a present to himself on his 90th birthday, which was in 19, yeah, that, it, was, it was in 2008. So that tells you how old he ended up to live yeah. to be. Yeah, this was about two years later that I we had the same guide. <laughs> You've been involved in politics and in government for a long time. And as we always do, it's ladies first when Danielle joins us for the podcast. So we're going to talk about your career in Carmel and your life story a little bit and your impact and what you see is going on in the future. But with that, I'll hand it over to Danielle. So I think uh, Robert teed that up nicely, Mayor, just to tell us, and for our listeners, right, who may not be from Carmel, and we actually hope our reach is far, tell us just a little bit about your background, where maybe you grew up, and what led you to this career of now being the mayor since 1996. Well, I grew up in a little town north of Goshen, just east of Elkhart, Indiana, about three miles from the Indiana-Michigan border in Indiana. Uh, it was a town of a thousand people. We ended up consolidating the schools with Elkhart. My dad and mother had met at Butler back in the 1940s. Uh, they're both musicians. We just went to my mother's 90th birthday party. Unfortunately, I lost my father about seven years ago. Um, but he was a school band director his entire life. And uh, so I went to Butler as well. Uh, majored. I, I did a lot of, I played in the band and orchestra, but I majored in uh, history and and had the equivalent of a minor in, in uh, speech communications. Uh, then went to law school, uh, was graduated from Ohio Northern University in Ada, Ohio, and then came back to Indiana, Indianapolis uh, in the early 80s and, and hung out a shingle and started a practice. Then raised four children in 1995, I ran for uh, mayor and uh, won in the primary. Uh, did not have opposition in the fall from the other party um, and have been mayor since uh, January of 1996. And it's been an interesting time because Carmel was 25, 26,000 people at the time. Today we're over 100,000 people. 
uh, and so we've had a lot of growth and, and it's been fun to, I mean, what a great opportunity to be able to help or just participate in building a brand new city. So between that, you know, that time leading up to 1995, you had a shingle, assuming things were going well professionally as a lawyer. What made you say, you know what, I think I'm going to run as run for mayor. Was there a step in between there? Or what, what happened? Well, I had always been interested in politics. I had done a little bit of work in high school for some local candidates. And then I was student body president my senior year at uh, Butler. Um, I uh, ended up working for Bill Hudnett, the former mayor of Indianapolis, when he was a congressman between my sophomore and junior years in college. Uh, it was when he was running against Andy Jacobs. So if you're old enough to remember that, you can do the math and figure out how old I am. But the uh, but uh, worked for Bill Hudnett. Uh, that's where I met P.E. McAllister the first time. He was the, the finance chair for that campaign. It was actually 1974. Um, the Republicans did not do well that year. That was a year of Watergate. But uh, great experience. And two years later, after my senior year in college, uh, for grad school, I uh, worked for uh, Ed Simcox down at the Republican State Committee as well. So I always had this interest in politics, and I had a particular interest in architecture and, and city building. Much more interested in the local level, I think, than uh, state or national politics. Thank you. I, you see, you know, I grew up during the Dick Luger and, and then Bill Hudnett and later Steve Goldsmith and the, these leaders of Indianapolis that really work together with the private sector to build the downtown that we have now in Indianapolis. And that, that was inspirational work for those folks. Eh? Indianapolis was not then what it is today. And it was because of their ability to bring people together. And secondly, hire the right people to put together a lot of public private partnerships to, to get this beautiful downtown that we have today constructed. So much of what happened in Indianapolis happened in those Unigov years, in the years where Hudnut, who was mayor until 1991. What specifically, I want to ask you about uh, Sen or Senator Mayor Luger first, but let's, let's start with Hudnut since you seemed like you had a closer connection to him. In 72, he runs for Congress, wins, beats Andy Jacobs. Two years later, runs for re-election, loses to Andy Jacobs. They developed a terrific friendship. One of the podcasts we did uh, was on the life and career of Andy Jacobs, and I did one on Bill Hudnut, just to talk about their careers, and it's cool how they intertwined. But is part of what you learned during that time how important it is to get along with folks, to build coalitions, to build bigger things? Exactly. Uh, Bill Hudnett's best skill was bringing people together. I think he always hated to make certain decisions because he had friends on both sides of every issue. But here's one thing that stands out from when I, between my sophomore and I was a rising junior in college, and just a kid working at this headquarters at 13th and North Meridian. And they'd be going to debates, other neighborhood association, different clubs, and so on. And Almost always, Jacobs had a really old car. It made a lot of noise. I remember that blew out blue smoke. He, he wasn't interested in material things. But he'd show up at Hudnett's headquarters, and that would walk out, and they'd go to these debates and appearances together. And they right. were running against each other. And I'm thinking, you know, we'd use some of that today. You know, our system, you know, after watching that debacle of uh, the first presidential debate the other day, I those friends and we I said let's go watch the Kennedy Nixon debate the first one on television mm -hmm. and it was the same thing you know they they both held strong opinions they were polite to each other they were civil and they talked about wanting to improve the country and the changes they both agreed on but then so we differ about the best way to accomplish that but it wasn't personal it was it was thoughtful uh, it brought out different ways of getting things done and that's what our representative democracy is supposed to do. And so I think it's important we look back at some of these leaders in different generations and remember how this system is supposed to work. It's not about tearing and burning down your opponent and being hurt snow, insulting people. It's about a clash of ideas, about the best way to accomplish progress for the people that live in this country. And that's what we've tried to do in Karma. We've tried to bring people from all different backgrounds and cultures and sites together, uh, throw out a lot of new ideas, 
about how to do things better. A lot of old ideas about things that got uh, abandoned for many years. And uh, th that's been our guiding, uh, our guide as we try to build this new city. When you look back to the time of, of let's, let's start with Senator Luger. Can you think of any particular things you learned from him? Like, you know, he did this, and we could talk about Hudnut too. We can actually go through the mayors because Indianapolis has had a terrific run of successful, impactful mayors. But do you, you know, we spend a lot of time in Indianapolis, I would say, looking at Carmel. Why can't we do this? Or do you see they did this? Why, let's do this too. But did it happen in the reverse? I mean, I know, I know you didn't build a stadium with no team. That's the ultimate Hudnut, you know, yeah. long ball. But that defines what, the word hootspot, I think. <laughs> <laughs> in our podcast we did on the career of Hudnut, we talked a lot about that. Joe Slash was there at the time, and yeah. Lucy Dietrich was on, and Dave Arlen, people I know oh, who, who you know. Absolutely. But what do you think of back of those years and go, I really learned something about what Hudnut or Luger or whoever did on this? What I learned from Hudnut was you got to bring the business community together with the government sector. And sure, there's some departments that have to regulate and do certain things, but if you get the business community working together with city government, uh, you can really almost accomplish anything. And that is what Bill Hudnut did so well. Dick Luger, you know, put the entire county and city together with the help of Bert Servas and others at that time. Um, and, and you know what? We all laugh a bit about it. Anybody you talked to from that era was the architect of Unigov. Successful. <laughs> you know, at least 30 people I've talked to, it was their idea. And when I think about it, that illustrates Luger's genius at getting people to work together. He had this entire group of people that thought that believed they were part of this improvement, believed they were part of this progress for Marion County and the city of Indianapolis. And that's the key to good leadership. How important is it for you as the mayor of a city or for a city in general, based on your experience, to just be left alone? Personally? By, by the state by people, by outside groups, like just leave us alone and let us do us do it our way. And then if you're unhappy, we can talk about it. But how much flexibility do you think local municipalities should have to do things the way they want to do them? We are talking about home rule, what uh, lawyers and people in the legislature refer to home rule. And it's really under attack across the United States. We had that issue here in Indiana. Uh, you know, these are big states, and what might be right for Gary and what's right for Evansville or Bloomington or Carmel may, are very different. And, and so I, I believe that the best government is the government where the leaders are out literally in the grocery store, in the barber shops, in the hair salons every day talking to the people that they represent. Um, you get down to the state house, you get insulated, you may not understand other parts of the state, you get to D.C., you certainly... Uh, are very insulated within that beltway or dealing with other issues. But I, I, I truly believe that local leaders are almost always going to make better decisions than people from farther away, whether it's the state capital or uh, Washington. Uh, Bloomington, there's an interesting case out of Bloomington a few years ago, and regardless of whether you agree with the decision or not, that community through their city council, representatives that have been elected by the people that live there, uh, decided to ban plastic bags. There were some people at the state legislature that didn't like that local decision from other places. And so they came in and said cities can't do that anymore. And it was it was a, a egregious example of the state legislature trying to micromanage cities. Whether you agree with it or not, it's just bad. Whether you agree with the actual decision, it's bad precedent. precedent. Let the locals make those decisions. Um, when it comes to fiscal uh, matters, yeah, some regulation by the state and municipalities makes some sense within reason. Um, and the reforms made during Governor Daniels' term allow for some of that. They set limits, the constitutional limits on on uh, on uh, property taxes. That all made sense. But yet, they provided a mechanism for local communities to override that for certain reasons through referenda. 
And that system's worked well. Just Carmel in the last few years have, has approved one by 90%, one with 60%, two referenda to uh, raise taxes uh, for our school system, which is uh, part and parcel of what cities have to do. If they're going to compete economically, you have to have a great school system. How do you feel? So they often say, you know, for um, for Carmel, for a Fishers, for a Zionsville to be as successful as we are, you need a you need a good downtown. And so I don't think any of us would disagree. Indianapolis has become an amazing downtown. How worried are you right now um, about downtown, given the COVID and the recent violence and increasing violence? And do you have any advice, maybe for Mayor for Mayor for Mayor Joe? I mean, how are you feeling about that interplay between a good downtown and the continued growth and success of Carmel. We're all in the same region, and I've gotten several inquiries from businesses that want to move their offices from downtown Indianapolis to Carmel, which is fine. But I'd much rather see those calls coming from Chicago and Miami and New York and mm -hmm. California than downtown Indy, uh, because they're staying within the region. It's not a net gain when that happens. Uh, you know, here's what we did when we had the civil disrest. We had nine days of protest in Carmel. We uh, said, number one, this the essence of our constitutional democracy is that people have the right to free speech and express their opinions, but they don't have the right to do violence and they don't have the right to do property damage. And so we took a very strong stand uh, we quadrupled our police force in nights. We had those protests. We put uh, people on roofs, parking garage, so they could be seen. We had drones in the air, so it could be monitored from our operations center several miles away. But we were not going to tolerate people's businesses and homes uh, being damaged. That is not part. And I had to, you know, kind of. I think we all noticed, you know, it was amazing what got destroyed in downtown Indianapolis happened to be the stores of the good stuff mm -hmm. uh, many times. And so it wasn't really about freedom of speech there. It wasn't about being unheard. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. has that famous quotation. It's like uh, rioting is, is uh, how's it go? Rioting is is uh, expression of the unheard or something more to that. I mastered it, I think, but you get the idea. You know, people were being heard. Uh, there was a lot of needless property damage in downtown Indianapolis. That's regrettable. We were not going to let that happen in Carmel. Have the have the donut counties, as we call them, mayors, come together to provide any formal, I guess, collaboration um, support to helping get Indianapolis healthy again? Well, I, I think we're all want to help the region do well. And I think most of the mayors here, you know, we don't tell each other how to do things. We say, how can we help each other? Uh, and we did that. We have, uh, you know, Carmel has had um, police officers, for instance, uh, participating at a very high level in, in high numbers of people is what I'm trying to say, uh, with, the, with the Indianapolis Drug Task Force. We have police officers that have been working on that with the city of Indianapolis for many years. Uh, we have mutual aid agreements with all the fire departments in Indianapolis that border uh, our city as well as, as the other cities and towns in Boone and Hamilton County. And it's important that uh, when one of us has a challenge, the others are there to help. Uh, all the mayors get along well together. Uh, we talk on a regular basis, uh, but we, we try not to tell each other what to do either. We um, or their help not to uh, critique. When a new mayor is elected in Indianapolis, you've been there for one, two, three, I think, new mayors. Started with Goldsmith and you've yeah, had- Goldsmith was in office when I was elected. He was in a second, he, he started a second term and I started my first and then it was uh, Bart Peterson, and Greg Ballard and now uh, Mayor Hogsett. Does it, is it something that you look forward to, that collaboration with somebody new? You, not that you didn't get along with the old person, but look, I've got a new fresh face and let me kind of help them as much as I can. Indianapolis is, is fun to govern, but it's a little bit of a tiger by the tail. How do you enjoy yeah. that personal relationship? Not just the cities, yeah. but personal. I love it. You get to know people and you get to know their management style and their leadership style and everyone's a bit different. 
And I can learn from that, watching the different styles. Uh, we had a young mayor from my alma mater, Butler, uh, elected in Noblesville last year. And he's in his early, mid-30s. And it's so much fun to see that energy uh, there at Chris Jensen uh, and his administration. They're just getting started. They're excited. They're trying all sorts of new things. Uh, he's working a lot harder than I remember the first term. You work really, really hard then because you're learning so many new things. At this point, hopefully, I, I'm well with COVID and, and everything. We've uh, with 2020, we're all putting in a lot of hours. But uh, at, when we get back to normal times, it's a lot easier doing what I do today than it was 24 years ago. We need to get Chris Jensen, Mayor Jensen, on the podcast. He and I worked at State Republican Party together. Uh, so years ago he's a good really good guy he is a good guy i've gotten to know him and i work well with andy cook up in westfield scott fadness is is working very hard over in fishers we have a new mayor in Zionsville. we're all getting to know and uh, she seems to be doing some interesting things but i'm also on the uh trustee of the u.s conference of mayors There's about 13 of us and that collaboration with mayors across the u.s I, I've truly enjoyed, um, you know, states are set up very differently. Indiana has what's called a, a strong mayor system where the mayors are the chief executive. A lot of other states, some of them go to the, we call the weak mayor states or council manager system might be a better system. The, uh, and some of them, you know, the mayor is basically the city council president and the city council together um, hires a city manager and they actually rotate the mayor every year among the city council members. Then there's kind of a hybrid where the uh, uh, mayor is not a member of the city council, uh, elected by the population in general, but still the council and the mayor or some combination of that will elect a uh, city manager. Um, and there's pros and cons to each system. You know, there's more continuity if the city manager stays between administrations. Often they don't. Um, if, if you've got a good group of people and a strong mayor and they you have some continuity there, I think that's always good, too. Uh, so there's different systems. But I've really enjoyed the collaboration and learning from mayors across the United States. I've also gotten to know some mayors from other countries. Uh, we have a sister city in Japan. I've gotten to be friends with a former mayor in Bristol, England, and a former mayor from Freiburg in Germany for some not-for-profit not work. I do some boards I sit on. And seeing, you know, you think, oh, there must be huge differences between what a mayor in England or Germany does and what a, a mayor in Indiana does. Not really. We all do the same thing. It's about potholes and, and essential services and fire departments and policing and economic development. Uh, and so that's, those have been fun. Uh, it's been a fun experience to be able to meet mayors from all over. When you go to another city and you have either for a meeting or for vacation and you have time to just walk around and see what there is to see, what's the first thing you look for? And have you found anything in a particular city that's really impressed you. Not, I'm not talking about the Mona Lisa, right, or the Eiffel Tower. I'm talking about, you're like, wow, I can't believe they do it this way. We need to figure out how to do that. Well, the first thing I do is talk to people in that city and try to find out what they're excited about. In their city. Some places you go, you get shrugs, and you, know, I don't, you can tell they don't have much ownership. Other places, you'll get people talking about some new project, whether it's a concert hall or a new road or a new park or something, that, some green issues, something that city's doing. And so I really try to find out what the people in that city are proudest of and are most excited about. And then I go take a look at those things. And I try to find that out from people on the street, not from, from the leaders of that city. But there's always something that every city is doing that's fun to see. Um, you know, it's great. City is a laboratory about how to create a high quality of life, a good place to live. You know, we've been coming together in human settlements for a millennia. Um, the car comes along and quick industrialization. We changed how we build our cities the last hundred years, uh, contrary to the way we built them for several thousand years beforehand. And so there's a lot of study going on currently about how to build cities where 
people are more interconnected. If you look back at, I was a history major, so I'm always focused on this. If you look back at the great cities of the world, there are often places where people came together on trade routes, people from different backgrounds, different races, different religions, and that's where you usually saw the greatest advancements in, in uh, human, uh, human advancement. Places where people from came together and the city was designed in such a way you're not driving in a snub nosed garage when all the houses look alike and there's no place to walk in the neighborhood and you spend your, your evening and mornings and weekends in the backyard or uh, separate from your neighbors but places where people are out in the community able to walk places where there's built into the city design there's places for people to come together um, Midtown Plaza in Carmel. I don't know how many of your listeners have been there, but we used a firm. We used a local firm. We also used, uh, I was on another board and met this great designer from Europe, very famous in Europe, named Ian Gale from Copenhagen. And he done some work in New York and, and uh, work in California and had offices in Asia and the Middle East as well as Europe. And the end, as he were doing work in the Midwestern part of the United States, he said no. And I said, well, it was a good price then. Well, I have a project we're going to send out an RFP for. So we matched him up with a local firm for our product sourcing and so on. We, we brought in some ideas about uh, bike friendliness, uh, about how to build pedestrian places from Scandinavia. And uh, it, it's good when you bring ideas from different places. We, I think, advanced our community because of that collaboration. Um, and then, you know, Carmel is for Indiana qualify it, but it's increasingly becoming a diverse place. Roughly 10% of our population is from the subcontinent of India. Roughly 10% of our population today is from China. Uh, we're growing African American population in Carmel. Uh, with people from every religion you can imagine, uh, uh, Hindi, Muslims, uh, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, uh, we have a Mormon temple now. You see all these different groups come together. And that's good for a city because people get to know people unlike themselves, start to meet them and talk with them. And as a result, you get a much better community, I think. So, I'm sorry. I was just, no, no, go ahead, Daniel. I was just going to say, I rode my bike past that Mormon temple not long ago and just stopped and got off my bike and stared at it. It's unbelievably gorgeous. It is a beautiful building. Mm -hmm. I was able, I'm not Mormon, but, but before they consecrated it, you were able to go, now Mormons, were able to go in. That's not the case after they consecrated, but I went on the tour with thousands of other people and, and it, it's, uh, you know, I didn't know much about it and uh, I learned something. And so I, you know, whether you agree or believe in a different religion or not, I know more about it now and I, I understand more about the people that have chosen or that are part of that uh, faith. And so that's a good thing. It's the more we know about people unlike ourselves, the better the community is going to be. So I was going to ask, you know, you said collaboration is amazing when you go other places. What are you most often asked about when they know of Carmel? What do you, what do you, what do they, what, what do they want to talk about the most? Is it the carousel or the roundabouts or? I think you knew the answer to that hmm. about a roundabouts. No, I really don't. Like I, the carousel's kind of famous too. I don't know. Yeah, a lot of places have done that. That was just a park amenity. I wish it had uh, been approved. Uh, but the uh, roundabouts and the our ability, we, we've managed to build about the safest road network of any city in the United States, and and that's why we build the roundabouts. They're safer, efficient, better for the environment. We save. Uh, tons of carbon every year by people not idling and not starting from zero. But safety is, is the big one. And that is we average in the United States is 14 fatalities per 100,000 people. Suburbs tend to be a little higher. Some roads are built for higher speeds and are wider. Uh, Carmel has a five-year trailing average of two fatalities per 100,000. None of them were in our roundabout uh, last four years. So it's a... Um, we, we get asked about that, particularly in the United States. You know, England's built 10, 11,000 roundabouts. France has built about 14,000. Germany has some. Italy have, has some. In the United States, we get asked about that a lot as other communities are looking for better ways to manage their traffic. And we, you know, we, one of the problems is, you know, 
we did get over 25% car ownership until after World War II. And then we spent 70 years designing our cities for cars and have people. So when we do a, a development, like that, we're trying to get away from that and add to uh, designing for pedestrians. That's to accommodate cars, of course, because we all drive them. Almost all of us drive them. But we're trying to focus on the same for people. People don't necessarily have to drive. I grew up in Irvington on the east side, and there's this big circle. Yeah. Actually, there's two. And I grew up just down the street from the circle, and you don't ever think of it being a roundabout, you know, on steroids, but it kind of is. And so the, yeah. I, the, the, the fulminations against roundabouts, I think they're an absolute necessity in high traffic areas. I'm no expert, but I've sat at the four-way stop for 15 to 20 minutes at 5.30 on a Friday because you simply just can't get through it. What was, and I, I'd like to talk about the environmental impact too, but who was the first person who came to you or can you remember the day where some planner or thinker said, Mayor Brainerd, take a look at this. This could solve some of our problems. Well, let me tell you the story. I, I was fortunate enough to do a little bit of my grad work and graduate work um, in England. And of course, I was a history major in speech and then a lawyer. So I remember when I was first elected mayor, I didn't take office. Here. I was with a friend of mine who's an accountant, and he we were riding in my car, and he points at some pipe out in the edge of the road. He says, is that water pipe or sewer pipe or gas pipe? What is it? I said, I have no idea. He said, well, you need to figure that out because you're going to have to work with all this stuff. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know anything about civil engineering. I always had an interest in architecture, but I didn't know anything about civil engineering. But when I was in grad school in England, um, I did see the roundabouts, the modern roundabout, I suppose the old traffic circles like Monument Circle or the circle you mentioned out in, in the Irvington or DuPont Circle in DC or Columbus Circle in Manhattan. Those are all rotaries or traffic circles and they're different. They're bigger, more lanes, uh, higher speeds, higher accident rates, higher fatality rates. The modern roundabout was invented by some English uh, civil engineers in the early 1960s and spread. And, and so I called a consulting engineer into my office uh, first month I was mayor in January of 96 and, and asked if he would uh, design some roundabouts for us. He said, no, they're taking those things out in New England. They're unsafe. And I knew I had seen those rotaries in New England and Boston and up in Rhode Island and that area and, and the ones in the middle Atlantic states and Maryland and Washington, D.C. as well. And I knew that what I was talking about and what he was talking about were totally different. Uh, but I wasn't smart enough that day to be able to argue with him. So I remember it was just a cold day in January, like below zero. I drove, I didn't know how to use the library. So I drove up to the Purdue Library, got a bunch of dimes because it was in the photocopy days, and found an article in the engineering library uh, that distinguished between, took six or seven hours. I finally found the right journals. And, uh, found some articles that distinguished between roundabouts and rotaries and why the roundabouts were safe and the rotaries weren't. So I copied these articles, took them back to my friend, the consulting engineer, and I said, go read these and then come back and talk to me. And so he came back and said, okay, I will design these and put my professional stamp on. It was a bit red faced because I had to uh, find some engineering articles he hadn't read, but that was simply an indication, I think, of how little Americans knew about roundabouts. That's how they came about. So we got George Sweet and Tom Houston to build the first one out at Prairie View, very close to where you live, Danielle. Uh, but that was a low traffic roundabout. But the same year we were planning and designing Hazeldale Parkway, which did not exist. And so we had two roundabouts initially put on Hazeldale Parkway, uh, which was uh, uh, 126 uh, and then Main Street. Back then we called it 131st. We didn't do it on 116th. Uh, we didn't have the one up at Cherry Tree. There wasn't enough development there at the time for 96th Street. We added those later. Uh, and that was a brand new street. There weren't any houses around it yet. So we just built them and then did a lot of public education. But those were the first two roundabouts with, with a fairly high uh, traffic count every day. And they worked out well. We had to make some adjustments to the first ones. We didn't get it right. We didn't get the angles quite right the first time. But today, the designers that worked on Carmel's roundabouts are in demand all over the country. 
because we have so much more experience than anybody else in the United States. We have 135, I think today, 136, one's about to open. Um, I think number two in the country would be Colorado Springs or Bend, Oregon. They each have about 30. Kind of. We're way ahead on the uh, total number. Uh, but our fatality rate is very telling. Our, our personal injury rate's down. Uh, property damage uh, amounts are down when there's a crash. It's all about speed. Human error rate doesn't change about speed. Everybody has to slow down at the roundabout. So, Danielle, you ever speed up for a yellow light? Oh Never, God, right? No, I, no, we're not going to talk about my drive. I was going to ask you about yours. No, what I was going to ask you, Mayor, is <laughs> have you ever been on a school bus full of second graders in a roundabout in Carmel? I have never been on the bus. I've seen those buses take them. I so get- I have had that privilege of being on a school bus, and they treat it like a roller coaster. So I, I've noticed that. <laughs> Not the driver, the children. <laughs> oh, okay. It's just like, we, this is fun, and they fall on each other. So You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, which is open, by the way, so please go visit my East Side Irish friends at the Golden Ace, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest on the Leaders and Legends podcast today is Carmel Mayor Jim Brainerd, and we are joined by our wonderful co-host and Carmel resident, CEO, Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Danielle Shockey. So, Mayor Brainerd, forgive me, this is a very controversial question. Are you ready? Yes. When's the last time you got upset at someone driving on a roundabout? Oh, it's like any other traffic control system. You get irritated at bad drivers, cut you off, roundabout's no different than any other uh, type of intersection, I think. I can't remember the last time I really got upset at somebody. But, or honked. Uh, oh, yeah, I probably go too slowly for them. <laughs> you get one honked, of those. You get oh, honked God. at. Yeah. You treat it like a four-way. Those are the worst. <laughs> you mentioned earlier your, your connection with Butler, and I did not go to Butler, but when you grow up in Irvington, you have a Butler connection because that's where Butler University used to be. Yeah, the second campus. And I grew up on University Avenue. So I never figured that out until I got to be an adult that there was a connection. You've Talk about how go much the Butler. Library up at the new uh, campus, the Fairview campus. They have a great model of the way that the Irvington campus looked back in the 1910s. Oh, in the current Butler campus? 1900s. Oh, it's well, fun I'm to happy see, to see that. Talk, talk about how much that university has meant to you and, and your family. Your parents went there, I believed. They, I believe. they were downtown at what was called Jordan Conservatory of Music at 14th and Delaware. And that conservatory was located in three houses where 65 cuts across uh, Delaware uh, today. Uh, those houses were torn down. And so when my dad and mother started, at Jordan Conservatory. It wasn't part of Butler, although they had a, a contract with Butler to provide, you know, some liberal arts courses as opposed to the fine arts courses offered at the uh, music conservatory. But halfway through my dad's career, I think between his uh, sophomore and junior year, and, and Jordan at that point was rated one of the top music. Uh, was up there with Eastman and Juilliard and University of Washington and St. Louis, um, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, it, it's a great place for music and dance and fine arts, but they, they went under financially and they combined with Butler. And so he has uh, degrees, had, had degrees hanging on the wall that said Jordan Conservatory of Music as well as Butler for a number of years. They gave out two diplomas because uh, people wanted that Jordan name on it. Uh, so it was, a, it was a great thing for Indianapolis to have both those institutions. Uh, Butler has done well over the years. Um, 
when I was, it was it's much larger today than when I was there. It had uh, about 1,600 undergraduates in the early 70s. When I was there today, it's about 4,000, slightly over 4,000. Um, there were a lot of students that were already working, living at home or living, already married, living off campus that were taking night classes at Butler. Really, the market segment that Indiana University and Purdue University at Indianapolis is serving now. So Butler was a very different place, but I had some wonderful professors. Uh, it was spotty, depending on what uh, what uh, subject you were in, but they had a great history department at Butler when I was there, and they had a just tremendous speech department, people from some of the best universities that were actively publishing, and teaching. Uh, I was challenged. It was academically rigorous, and I got a good grounding for uh, graduate school. Which of Butler's two NCAA title game losses did you take harder? You know what I took the hardest? was the fact that the first year they went, I gave up my season tickets I'd had for 20 years because I thought I was too busy. They were on the, uh, the center line right behind the Butler bench about three feet. Oh, no. And, and the first year they went to the NCAA a final game, that was the year I had given up those tickets. Probably couldn't have afforded them the second year, but I could have had them. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I took the hardest. Uh, oh, both those games were heartbreakers. I think particularly the first one where that last shot was missed, had that gone through, that would have been just, you know, hit the rim and bounced off. And, you know, the, the game had already ended after, right after the uh, ball left the player's hands. And uh, it, uh, it will always go down in the history books. But it really would have been famous had that shot gone in. That was probably the toughest one. You think about, I was in the mayor's office for that one, I believe, working for my former boss, Greg Ballard. What was it like to have your alma mater become the darling of the country, really? You're a former president of the Butler Alumni Association. For, for a week there and for days, the Butler way and how, how is this small town quote unquote hickory college for lack of a better term, nearly upset the Godzilla Goliath of college basketball, just in terms of, of, of pride as an alumnus, what was that like? Well, it was, that was fun. I remember when they kept going through the, the final four games right before the final, I, I was in California giving a speech in Healdsburg, uh, roundabouts of course they were building a roundabout and asked me to come out and talk, tell our stories and offered to pay for it so I did and I was getting on a plane I think I was flying through Salt Lake City so I was getting on a plane probably it was one of the few Indianapolis people on that plane between Oakland and, and Salt Lake City and, or I think it was Southwest and then I was getting a non-stop back to Indianapolis and so I get on that plane and about 80% of the people getting on that plane had Butler gear on. And I'm thinking, I'm probably the only Butler graduate on this plane. I didn't have any gear with me. I didn't have my T-shirt or sweater. But that that was a proud moment. I So I asked some of these people, I said, go to Butler now. And we were just, we were just, it's just such a great story. They were all rooting for Butler because they were such the underdog. And... Um, it, it was, that's the moment that I remember. Like people across the country are excited for Butler and it gave it uh, uh, standing. You know, a university wants to be known, I think, for its great ideas, its, its uh, contributions, the advancement of our civilization. But uh, everybody watches sports. It's a good way to get your name out there. It's, it's interesting. I have to confess that on my way up to Carmel, even though we're doing this via Zoom, I did listen to the Yes song, Roundabout. <laughs> I, I walked into a uh, talk <laughs> in Wisconsin once, and <laughs> as they introduced me, they timed it so that Yes, Roundabout song blasted out over the speakers as I was walking up to the podium. <laughs> that was fun. But back to <laughs> Butler for a minute. Um, it, it's, it was a great thing. You know, I remember I was on the board back when Jeff Bannister was president. I remember something he said once. This is long before, you know, they got to the level of the, of the, of the final game of the NCAA. But he says, um, 
you know, we may have a great pianist playing at Carnegie Hall and recognize Butler's name because of the basketball team. And there's <laughs> that meant you no longer had to explain Butler. Where's that? I've never heard of that. They exactly. Is that, yeah. Is that is that some sort of college that teaches people how to be butlers? <laughs> So we have, uh, you know, coming towards the end of the show. So there's two themes and I circled them for Robert and I said, you know, which one do I want to ask? And one of them is climate change. And the other is arts and culture and its relationship to fostering economic development. So I know both are th something that you speak of frequently. So I want to let you pick which one would you like to tell us um, kind of your philosophy, your perspective as the mayor on that level of importance. Um, which one's your passionate topic today that you'd like to share a little bit more about? Well, let's start with climate change at least. Um, I think, you know, I've yet to meet, a, you know, people ask me because I'm a Republican and Republicans today in general are, are not as patient about uh, the environment as as uh, the Democratic Party. And, and so I get asked a lot, why is this important to you? And I point out that I've yet to meet a Republican or a Democrat that wants their family to drink dirty water or breathe dirty air uh, or suffer the health impacts of either. And then I point out many times, and traditionally this has been a nonpartisan issue, it was Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican, who uh, set aside most of our national parks. It was Eisenhower, a Republican in the 1950s, who set aside the Arctic Reserve. It was... Nixon and Ford, both Republican presidents, of course, in the 70s, who signed the legislation establishing the Environmental Protection Agency. First time we had ever had a national agency focused on the environment. Uh, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Migratory Bird Act, all these things were Nixon Ford projects. And we had President Reagan, who I think under the tutelage and advice of Margaret Thatcher, who was a chemist, uh, got concerned about the ozone hole in the Southern Hemisphere at the pole. And, you know, had that happened in the Northern Hemisphere, we could have had huge uh, spikes in cancer rates. Uh, most of the population of the Earth is in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and so they went and, and, and led the way for the international community to sign the Montreal uh, Protocols uh, to uh, ban ozones and avoid having that uh, ozone hole in, in, in the North Pole. Uh, so we have this history, you know, Bill Ruffles Mm -hmm. House of Indiana was the first EPA administrator under President Ford and the Nixon. Um, just unfortunately died a, a few months ago. The, uh, we have this great history of Republicans and Democrats coming together to improve the environment. And I think the Republican Party needs to get back to that. We'll always have disagreements on how to do that. Uh, but we shouldn't argue with science. We must listen to science. We must believe the apolitical scientists who are telling us we, we need to pay attention. Uh, it, it's, you know, we're all taught as kids, you know, leave the earth in a better place than you found it. Uh, and, and that's what we need to do. And it's important to farmers in Indiana and the Midwest, too. They see new pests because of the climate changes, new pests evolve, they eat their crops. They have different growing patterns they used to have. They're too much rain, too little rain, depending on the area. Uh, people say, well, we can just move the, uh, uh, you know, the soybeans and corns to more northern climates. But we really can't because the soils aren't as good. Uh, you go farther north, it just doesn't work uh, very well. Uh, we, in so many of our cities and so much of the U.S. population, the rural population, really is located in low-lying areas on our coast. And, you know, when the ice melts, uh, water takes up, you know, creates more room and it takes up more volume as water than it does as ice. And so we have to worry about uh, rising sea levels to create wars, and create all sorts of displacement. You need to pay attention to this. But there's a good side to it, too. The world's looking for jobs of renewable energy and products that are better for the environment with our wonderful universities in this country we should be leading the way not just on designing those products but manufacturing them and selling them around the world it could be a great thing for our economy as well and i think that's uh, one way uh, uh republicans and democrats could come together on this and then city design has a huge amount to do with it too you know we have to design our cities 
uh, so that people aren't spending two hours a day in their car. Uh, it makes a lot of financial sense uh, because the sprawl is so expensive. But not only do we build better cities, uh, medical, mental and physical health are better. There's all sorts of studies on that. But we also use a lot less fuel if the city is more denser. Yeah. We're all, uh, the huge parking lots, double the number of fire departments you need. Cost five million bucks a year to staff a fire department. You have, you're going to have ten, or you're going to have five in your city. Uh, we we have not paid very attention to how, for the last seventy years how we build cities that work for the environment and work for the people who live in them. So another, I'm going to switch up my question just for a second. If you could put on a baseball cap and go spend two hours somewhere in Carmel. What would be your, what, where's your place? What's your favorite activity, your favorite restaurant, your favorite, you just want to go be Jim and not be the mayor. Where would you go? Well, anywhere in Carmel, I'm going to be the mayor. So. <laughs> but, All but, right. Where, but you know what I mean. Where's your favorite know, place? One of my favorite places in Carmel, and this goes back to your, your question a minute ago, and that would be the Palladium. We built, because Indianapolis had done so much for professional sport or Initially, the governing bodies of amateur sports, rowing, swimming, brought all these, many of them in Colorado Springs, brought many of these organizations during the hundred years to Indianapolis, and later the, the uh, professional sports in Indianapolis. We thought, you know, there's been an underinvestment in the arts and culture, and all great cities uh, need places for people to see great artists, great musicians. And they also need outlets to be able to be creative and, and so we thought you know indianapolis doesn't have a concert hall we have a couple great theaters uh but we don't have a concert hall they're different animals they're similar but different and so we now have one of the country's top concert halls there's about 20 in the united states it's never for sitting in march but one room designed for music um and and we didn't have a downtown in carmel either um and, and so we anchored that downtown that we were trying to build through public-private partnerships with arts organizations. So we had the Palladium, and we had the two smaller theaters across the uh, Carter Green in the James Building. We've had the Cat not too far away. We now have, uh, you know, we chose to build these landmark buildings right in, in what will be the center of our downtown for generations to come, and. So those places that I have spent a lot of time uh, working on most of my adult career as mayor, trying to work with the private sector to create really special places. Look, I say we're just like Paris uh, in France. Lousy weather, no mountains, and no oceans. They did just fine. <laughs> we can too. But it's about building these special places that, that people want to visit and want to live near. They want to work near, and 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 so the best of those special places in Carmel, in my mind, would be the Palladium. And if I had uh, just one day to spend in Carmel, uh, the rest of my life, I'd probably go see a show at the Palladium. Thank you. No, and thank you for. I love living here. So thank you for for everything. Absolutely everything. Uh -huh. You mentioned uh, we end all podcasts with the same five questions to everyone. We'll get to those in just a second as we wind up the Leaders and Legends podcast with Carmel Mayor Jim Brainerd. But you talked a little bit about the environment and connectivity. These are all very uh, creating a place people want to live, especially young folks that want to move. Uh, this is very familiar to me because when I worked in the office of Mayor Greg Ballard, those were his mantras. He has done terrific work with regard to connectivity and has been a leading voice using his credibility, quite frankly, of spending 23 years as an officer in the Marine Corps and being deployed overseas in the war zone during the Persian Gulf War in the early 90s. What do you think of Greg Ballard's conversation that he started and his efforts to address the use of fossil fuels as a way of creating a cleaner city and sort of, as best we can, reduce the chances that young men, like my son, 
Joshua, who did two tours in Afghanistan, that young men like him have to go overseas? Well, thank Joshua for me for that sacrifice that he made. Uh, it's so important for our country that we have young men and women who are willing to join the military, put their lives, risk, put their permanent careers on hold to protect us and, and to protect our values and our system. Uh, there are bad people out there in the world, and it's appreciated. Greg Ballard is one of my heroes for what he did in the environment. He uh, is a Republican mayor. Uh, made tremendous strides, uh, was looked to as a leader by other mayors of major cities across the United States. It was an interesting statistic. Greg actually appears, Mayor Ballard appears in a movie that was put out, uh, talks about why the military is trying to get away from fossil fuels. Some large statistic, I don't remember the exact one, it was 85 or 90 percent, I believe, of our fatalities in the Persian Gulf War were getting fuel to the front line for their mechanized equipment. Um, and one of the points of this movie is if, if that army is able to operate on solar and battery and, and possibly other fuels that don't require gasoline, you know, being taken through dangerous areas, uh, the number of fatalities and injuries that our military experiences could be uh, experiences could be lowered dramatically, and that's a very telling thing too. Uh, one of the costs that we never look at for the environment is the cost of bad air quality, in particular. Uh, we've got water quality improvements in the last century, but air quality still has a long way to go. Uh, and how many? What is the cost of all the cases of asthma, of COPD, of lung disease that's exacerbated by or made worse by poor quality air? Uh, and there's, we need to get away from coal. We need, we need to do that from a competitive standpoint, if nothing else. Uh, but we also need to quit burning coal. Uh, look at the true cost just not the cost of converting a coal plant to a gas fire plant or you know, whatever, whatever might be better. Uh, but look at the health cost, all the these that made worse are caused by uh, uh, poor quality air because of the way we produce it on the country. Another problem, devastating problem, is the COVID issue that you've been dealing with and elected officials and citizens and basically everybody anywhere. I give a lot of credit to Hoosiers and Americans for how they're handling it. We're all frustrated. Uh, but folks like you who have to implement, craft and implement policy on this pandemic are under a, a completely different microscope, no pun intended, than the rest of us. Uh, you have someone who I'm guessing you love very much, who's I hope's been pretty helpful to you, and that's your son, Jack, who's a physician. Have you leaned on him? Have you talked to him? Has it been something that you've been able to call him and say, okay, tell me, tell me not what I should do, but why it's important to do something? Absolutely. I have leaned on him. I've also leaned on my youngest daughter, Martha, who is a biologist, um, going to medical school right now, which she's out of the Dana-Farber labs in, um, in, uh, in, in Boston. And uh, she's uh, doing research, cancer research, but, but really understands a lot of the epidemiology as well. And so I called on both of them uh, to help me. You know, I'll call Martha and say, turn this article into everyday language so your old father can understand it. Uh, but both of these uh, kids, uh, you know, I have, have two others that aren't in those fields, but, uh, uh, but I've called on both of them to help me a lot with, um, with understanding uh, how we should react to this. Uh, and I've called on your local hospitals too. The medical directors of both uh, the major Carmel hospitals have been tremendously helpful 
in helping us craft a city response. Our county health people are, are, are wonderful public servants uh, who have worked really hard throughout COVID. You know, early on, we didn't know what we were dealing with. You know, we thought that uh, vents were going to be important. We had to give people oxygen like we did for the flu. Now we find out the oxygen causes the virus to grow at a faster rate. So the best treatment, is, I, I'm told, is not to give oxygen. So we've learned a lot in the last seven, eight months about this particular disease. You know, we had to shut down the city for a number of weeks in the beginning, limit it to essential traffic only. While, while we learned, while we tried to get prepared or we tried to get personal protection equipment for our EMS, we were very fortunate to be able to work with a local lab, figured out how to make COVID tests, the CDC COVID tests. Uh, locally, when, when they were in, in uh, short demand across the country, uh, they were very ingenious how they managed to get the different parts to, uh, of, of what was needed to make those tests. So we started testing our city employees back in, in late March uh, when tests were in very short supply. Because we have EMS guys, uh, men and women, taking, uh, taking uh, COVID patients to the hospital and ambulances. Uh, we have police officers that have to be out interacting with the public every day. Uh, you know, our essential workers were out there, particularly the EMS and the firefighters. And so we had a fairly high positivity rate, so it was absolutely critical we'd be able to identify those people. Uh, and they're still being tested weekly, all the police officers and, and firefighters and EMS workers. Uh, and then when somebody's positive, we've had a lot that are. Uh, they self-quarantine. We do our own contract tracing because uh, we can do it within a few hours. Uh, we do that through the fire department as well. Uh, and we've managed to, uh, we had one firefighter that became very sick, recovered. Uh, the others, though, we've managed to keep the, uh, uh, some cities, uh, fire departments, EMS uh, workers have been ravaged by this uh, pandemic. We managed to keep ours under control. And, and most importantly, we have the assisted living and nursing homes in Carmel working very closely County Health and with our fire department, uh, who's been doing a lot of site visits and working with the administrators, helping them, especially in the early weeks, helping them get protocols in place. Uh, we've protected our most vulnerable uh, as best we can. Uh, we've had about 100 and some deaths in Hamlin County, about 30 in Carmel, which is 32 many. But you start to look at data that's far less than we've had in many other places in the country. So I think it's worked. It's worked in a large extent, too, because people in Carmel are paying attention to what they can do there. And that's important. Indianapolis is always going to have a higher uh, rate of both infections and deaths because of the vulnerable population they have at the Veterans Hospital. Methodist Hospital is the largest. I didn't know this. The highest number of ICU beds in any hospital in the country. Um, you have a lot of vulnerable people. Uh, in Indianapolis, especially in some of the poor neighborhood. Um, but I think overall, Indiana has done well. I hope that this, uh, the two hot spots we have going in southwest Indiana and northwest Indiana get get better soon. Uh, but our governor's taking a very balanced approach, I think. He's trying to get businesses reopened, at the same time stressing that it's up to every individual uh, to do the right things to take care of our neighbors. All right, Mayor, thank you for all of your great uh, in-depth responses. We would appreciate it, but we do always end with but five. That's a nice way to say I'm talking too much, I think, isn't it? No, it was not. No, actually, what I was going to say was our last five are rapid response. Okay. So you, you, they're, okay. meant, they're meant to be your first, your first answer. So what was your first job? Mowing lawns as a 12-year-old. What was your first concert? My dad was a band director. So my first concerts were high school band concerts when I was a real little kid. Okay, what was your first Whoa. concert concert? I know, <laughs> Robert's not gonna let it go with that. <laughs> it's not your little brother playing the harmonica. <laughs> um, probably uh, Jimmy Buffett, I think it was Jimmy Buffett. Yeah, I didn't have a lot of money when I was in college and grad school and there weren't many, so I think it was Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> All right. Um, if you could suggest a book for someone to read, what book would you recommend? Oh, there's so many. I'd probably read a good biography of Abraham Lincoln. 
This is a tough question for history majors, but uh, is there a particular Lincoln book you enjoyed? Many of them. The one written by his law partner, uh, and, and the name escapes me right at the moment. The one William, written, William Herndon. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Bill Herndon. Is um, it's been criticized, but everyone should read it. It really is a window, I think, into Lincoln's character and the fact that you know this guy was living basically homeless as a kid. They were living in a three, a lean-to out of the middle of the wilderness. He becomes president of the United States, and he saves the Union through his good decision making. Uh, I mean, it's a story. We're, we all know that story, but step back for a minute and just think what that story means in the collective mind of, of Americans. Um, it so illustrates what the American dream is in this country and what it can be. Lincoln's uh, one of my heroes. I, I'd start with, if I had to name one book, I'd probably heard him's Lincoln. All right, thank you. So this will also be hard, um, being that you're a history, not only buff, but major. If you could be at one event in history and witness it firsthand, what event would you choose? Going back and forth between two, I think I'd like to be there with General Knox, who had pulled those cannon over from Fort Detroit. Tyson Naroga in New York and pulled across the frozen ice of Lake Champlain and then put up on Breed's and Bunker Hills and kicked the British out of Boston. I'd like to be up there on Breed's Hill and talk to the men and women as it, here they were taking on the greatest power in the world. There were farmers and there were booksellers in General Knox's case and there were uh, jewelers and ordinary people that said, we've had enough. We want a country governed by the average person. And that was so revolutionary at the time. <laughs> and in many ways still is. Uh, I would have loved to be there to see the start. Of that. So Robert gets to ask these questions to, you know, all kinds of leaders and legends. Is that the first time you've ever had that answer? So the first time in any particular incident of the Revolutionary War was mentioned, I, I think the others were, um, Maybe someone mentioned surrender at Yorktown. That's October 19th, 1781. A lot of people have said signing of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be an American history. Well, my second would have been the Constitutional Convention to be able to sit in on, just hear it be a mouse in the corner of the room and listen to those. You think you, know, you, you, think you could get them to stick a roundabout constitutional clause? <laughs> in, <laughs> Had you been there? <laughs> No, I don't think I would have suggested that. <laughs> <laughs> that should That's be awesome. up to the local community to figure out the best solution for that city. That's right. Home rule. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> last question. All right. Last question. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, two hours off the record, um, just to chat, who would you choose? Anybody living today. Historically, that would be easy. Um, today. I've got to think about that. I, I just can't answer that off the top of my head. There would be several, but uh, I don't know if I could pick one. I want to think about that for a while. You didn't tell me that one in advance. So I just don't know. Robert doesn't let people off like this easy, though, so I don't know if he's going to let you go with... You're going to you think can, about it. You could choose Dan McFeely. I could. Um, I could. And Dan and I have had many nice dinners together. Um, I think I'd like to probably talk to somebody in the cutting edge of sciences, one of the Nobel laureates, that is focused on the, you know, and Elon Musk might be in it. I'd love to talk to that guy and what drives him. Um, I'm amazed at some of the things he comes up with, but but he's had some success too at, at uh, changing the way people look at everyday problems. Uh, he would be a fascinating. I don't know if he's number one, but he'd be a fascinating person. And what's his name? Elon Musk. Oh, Elon, oh, Elon Musk. Yeah, I was just yeah. going to say, pun intended. What yeah. what drives him? <laughs> you got that. Thank you, Danielle. You're welcome. <laughs> 
You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Thank you very much to Carmel Mayor Jim Brainerd and our illustrious co-host, CEO Girl Scouts of Central India, Danielle Shockey, very much for the podcast. We enjoyed it. It was a great conversation and we appreciate your time, sir. Great to be with you. It was fun. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Thank you.